All right. So I'm going to go a little bit off of my script and just take a second and summarize the UNDP report because there's one actual takeaway from this report that's actually helpful for you. And I'm going to tell you what it says. Um, what the report says is this, ultimately. In every group that is recruiting into violent extremism, there are kind of this mass of people who are vulnerable to participation. They've developed grievances, they've been exposed to messages, um, they are living in communities that are poor, that have poor um, employment opportunities, all the things that you already know. But in general, the choice to begin participating in violence, what the UNDP report finds, much of the research done on participants from Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram, is that there is typically a tipping point, some moment at which the decision is reached to depart from just sort of being aggrieved and perhaps a little sympathetic to actually participating. For the vast majority of people, that tipping point is an experience of state violence. That is the single most important thing that comes away from that comprehensive study on the drivers of violent extremism in the African context. People who are already aggrieved and vulnerable to participation tip into joining because a family member is killed, because they have an encounter with the security services where they're demeaned or degraded or they suffer some kind of violence, and that tends to be the moment. So if you want to take anything away from all of that, that's, that's the summary, that's the sort of key thing. Okay, um, so to get back to my script. Um, in general, I think most analysts today, people who do what I do, tend to steer clear of this language of root causes because of the implications it has for the way that we think about violence. And I think the reason is this, right? The idea of a root cause suggests that if only we can eliminate the root, then we will have solved the problem. And in general, people who've studied the factors of participation in violent extremism don't really understand it that way. There is no sort of one root or one cause that if you can dig it up will end things, right? We have been looking for a profile or some way to be able to clearly define who participates and who doesn't. It would appear that such a profile cannot be made or doesn't exist. I realize that this is disappointing, but we, there doesn't seem to be some sort of universal um, profile. Instead, people in my line of work tend to use this language of drivers. Um, factors that can nudge or pull someone a little bit closer to or away from participation, but none of which on their own determine whether or not you join. And in general, we use this metaphor of push and pull factors, which I like very much as a metaphorical way of understanding how you come to participate. Push factors, right, that sort of impel from behind participation are experiences with state violence, economic need, or the insecurity of your community. We know that a lot of people join or become participants in violent extremist organizations because they live in communities that are threatened and they think that by joining, they can provide a measure of security to their families. Pull factors, on the other hand, are sort of inducements, right? They pull you into the group. Financial incentives, a desire among young men for adventure or status, ideology and messaging. And so we have this combination of pushing factors and pulling factors. <coughs> now, how does this actually work in the context of Boko Haram and ISWAP? It's very difficult to know in any individual group precisely what combination of these two sets of factors are at play, in large part because as far as I am aware, there has never really been a comprehensive study that has looked at a truly cross-sectional representation of all of the participants in any given group. And if you think about the experiences that many of you have had, this makes sense. Who are the former VE participants that you have access to? They generally fall into two categories. They are people who defected, or they are people who were captured. And I suspect that you all understand that people who defect are probably different than other members of the group in important ways. They had dissatisfactions with the group, they had grievances, were angry about something, and so they defected. You can learn a lot about what might cause someone to defect, but not necessarily about what might cause everyone to join. Similarly, people who are captured may potentially be different than other members of the group because they were the ones who were captured, right? They may have had a different status or role in the group than those who were not. They may have a, a different level of training or experience. And so if all you have access to are those who defected and those who were captured, you don't really have a full sense of the, the, the the, all of the things that are driving participation. Similarly, and this is the problem with this complex sort of network, 
there are lots of people in the societies that we're talking about who share almost all of these factors and yet don't participate. We talked about this on Monday, the gentleman from Uganda. It is incredibly important, I cannot stress this possibly enough, to compare the people who have joined with people who have similar profiles who have not participated in violence. If we want to get beyond this complicated morass and into more specific drivers, we have to know the difference between vulnerable people who ultimately choose not to participate and vulnerable people who are pushed or pulled in. If you have access to resources, if you have money available, invested in this. This is incredibly important if you really want to understand what's going on. Okay. Um, so let's put, well, put simply in the context of northern Nigeria. Um, violent extremist groups in, in northern, northeastern Nigeria in the Lake Chad Basin are defined more than anything else by their adaptability. They have changed considerably over the last decade <clears throat> in the ways in which they recruit and in the profile of the people that they recruit. None of the groups that plague your countries are static, right? They will adopt different strategies for bringing people into violent extremism depending on the circumstances and depending on what you do, right? This is the challenge of doing this sort of thing. As you change the strategies that you're employing, the groups that you are attempting to counter will themselves recruit differently. It's always going to be a dynamic process. But in the context of Boko Haram, we can speak of some periods of time in which different kinds of strategies were used to recruit people into violent extremism and different profiles of recruitment and participation existed. And we can generalize out from these to think about the kinds of experiences, the things you might be looking for to see what might happen to lead a group to become violent or sort of what the starting point is and how they evolve and change as their military strategies evolve as well. Make sense so far? Okay. So the early Boko Haram, sometimes called the Nigerian Taliban, um, pre-2003, pre the insurgency, the sort of insurrection in Kanama in Yobe State, was a small group and it was very ideologically oriented. It was a mix of well-educated middle and upper class youths and ideologues. They appear to have recruited from Salafi circles in Maiduguri from just a handful of mosques, and as well as from students at the University of Maiduguri. And this was an era in which those poll factors were predominant, right? The messaging was what seemed to be most important in compelling people to want to participate. But there are limits to how large a group like that can be. It's a very specialized message. It's unlikely to be something that's going to develop a group of thousands and thousands of people. Now, after that first moment of violence in 2003, 2004, the group um, begins to grow rapidly beyond that small intellectual cohort. In large part, this growth appears to be driven by classic community building efforts, and the general referenced this earlier. Muhammad Yusuf cultivated a sense of belonging and required, and this is important, a significant commitment from people who wished to be part of the group. This is one way that you ensure that people will go along, right? You say, if you want to be part, Hand over your earnings. If you're making money in a job, give them to us. We're going to be responsible for distributing them. While actively fundraising to provide resources for those who made the commitment. So you ask for much to join, but then you give in exchange, right? Th these resources included access to land, business funds, motorcycles, mm -hmm. um, the famous motorcycles from the, the governor of Borno State. There was some recruitment from a com among committed religious ideologues, but equal if not greater commitment from among the youth the aimless and disaffected, the looking for meaning. We know this from first-hand accounts at the time. The group remained insular, it was highly structured and organized, and they were capable of acting with purpose. This allowed them to grow from a very small core of people to a much larger core over the course of a number of years. Right? If you see a group like this emerging, this is the moment to become worried. Right? Now, in 2009, there is again the, the uprising in Borno. Um, depending on sort of whose story you, you prefer, it's either induced by Yusuf or by the military. Um, but post the insurgency, or post the uprising, we have about 1,000 Boko Haram members who die. The group once again has to retrench and change strategy. After the group rebounds, the focus appears to be on a combination of ideological pull and push from the experience of state violence. Indeed, this is the high period when um, revenge against security services and the government seems to have played a big role in recruitment into the group. It expands rapidly, but it does not appear to become a mass movement. And I think that this is very much the same in a lot of the instances that you all are familiar with in other places. 
It's not the case that Abu Bakr Shakao was able to find tens of thousands of willing recruits. That message was still only resonant with a few thousand people, enough to actually bring them in and cause them to engage in violence. There was at this moment some recruitment from beyond the Northeast. In particular, we're starting to see, um, depending on who you ask for the first time, recruits from Chad and Cameroon. But those, um, that recruitment was likely limited by the things that were pulling people in at the time, which were that experience of violence. Now in 2013, you have the good news. The good news of the Civilian Joint Task Force and the Nigerian military being able to largely push the group out of the urban environment. They become at that moment a rural insurgency. This is sort of a classic kind of insurgency in the African context. And oddly enough, that sort of defeat, that driving out of Meduguri, paradoxically makes the group more threatening and more dangerous. This is the era of push factors as the group moves into the rural area. Economic incentives and coercion become incredibly important ways to draw people into the group because they have this space that is not especially well defended by security services where they're able to threaten, offer inducements, and this is really when the group grows, not at the highest moment of ideological attraction, but at the moment of highest insecurity. Evidence suggests that many participants are joining because of promises of money, capital for small business. There's a wonderful report done by the NGO Mercy Corps that interviews a handful of people who had been former participants. And what it finds is that they were all poor, but they were generally not the poorest. They were the people who had a little bit of capital for starting a business, who maybe had been engaged in a little bit of petty trade, and were looking for a foothold, a way to go from being sort of on their, the hustle to having a bigger and better opportunity. They weren't the poorest people in society. Others are joining, and again, we know this from evidence, because of rising rural insecurity, because they're trying to keep their businesses afloat in an area that's occupied. They're trying to protect their families from kidnapping or from other kinds of insecurity. There's also, of course, the era of actual kidnapping and direct coercion into the group. From about 2016 on, and I really see the surge of troops that happens before the election in 2015 Nigeria as being kind of a dividing line here, we have the split in the group between those who would adopt a strategy um, of sort of violence against ordinary Muslims living in the region and those who are looking for a more targeted kind of insurgency that is drawing from the lessons of the Islamic State. And in particular, since that split happened from 2017 on, we see a lot of reporting that the Islamic State in West African is systematically attempting to cultivate more mass support by borrowing at a lower level of sophistication, certainly, from the Islamic State playbook. Taxation, not just used for revenue, but to maintain trade, to keep markets open and supplies available. Some law and order, again, at significantly lower levels than what Daesh was able to do. There's lots of evidence that the group is acting flexibly, appearing, trying to appear benign or supportive of local communities, less overtly brandishing weapons when they go into communities. That they're offering their ideological messaging after the communities have been softened a little bit by this initial contact that's not quite as bad, um, and providing for various levels of participation. And again, note the difference between this and the strategy of pre-2009. Today, if you want to be part of the Islamic State, that can just mean selling fish, right, or selling cattle. The commitment that is required is not the same as the commitment that was required by Yusuf's group before, right? <clears throat> that there are sort of now multiple different ways that you can become involved and enmeshed in the conflict. Now I'm almost done, so question, questions are rising. What are the takeaways here? Um, well, I told you a little bit about the UNDP report already. Um, another important finding, I think, from that report is that uh, many participants cite religion as being an important factor in their participation, but we do see some evidence, as many of you, I think, already would have argued, that those who have a higher level of religious sophistication or greater religious education do appear to be a little bit less likely to engage or participate, that finding is soft. I'm not sure how much confidence I have in it, but there's some evidence that that's true. Um, and again, that tipping point experience seems to be very important. Uh, in the broadest sense, it appears that the insurgency in the Lake Chad Basin does look similar to what you see in other parts of the continent, albeit that in other parts of the continent, insurgencies have had a tendency, violent extremist groups, to start in that kind of rural phase. I like to tell people that there were 10 million people living in Borno before the insurgency started. That's nearly as many people as live in Cameroon, right? This was not a, 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 a 
unpopulated, ungoverned area. This was a densely populated place with a lot of urban centers. The government wasn't necessarily especially effective, but it was not absent. So you are going to see different patterns in this context than you would in, for example, northern Mali. Again, we see ISWAP in particular trying to garner support. Um, but before we get carried away with this idea that they're winning hearts and minds in rural areas, remember that what they're providing remains fairly rudimentary. We are unlikely to find huge caches of documents pointing to a well-oiled bureaucracy like we see in Iraq under occupied territory. Um, ISWAP remains strapped for cash and resources. There's no oil revenue that they can tap into like in Iraq. Um, and they seem a long ways away from being able to provide a viable alternative to the Nigerian state. And again, I think that there are parallels here between this experience and other parts of the continent as well. The insurgencies that we are talking about may be attempting to govern, but it is not a level of government that people would prefer over a real high quality state supplied governance. This is important. They also understand, ISWAP does, the dangers of state building. Because many of the biggest defeats that the group suffers in 2015 are because they were entrenched. They were attempting to establish their caliphate. They had settled down. And so when the Chadians and the Nigerians and the Nigerians come in, the group suffers heavy losses. ISWAP has become increasingly flexible because it recognizes that digging in puts them at risk potentially. We see this very clearly. I think it's better to think of the situation as the Nigerian state losing hearts and minds rather than the Islamic state necessarily gaining hearts and minds. The transnational aspect, we see some evidence of small variations in recruitment dynamics. We seem to think that in Chad and in Cameroon, recruits um, have been more induced than necessarily pulled ideologically. Uh, or sorry, pushed ideologically, or pulled ideologically, that money and opportunities for commerce played a bigger role. But again, we're not entirely sure. Um, and again, just sort of for takeaways as you think about how this relates to what you're experiencing, it is really obvious from looking at this time frame that groups like ISWAP and Boko Haram are reactive and dynamic, that what governments do to combat them shapes in turn their strategic framework. And so investing in programs is crucial and important, but the things that work to combat a group at a particular stage in their development may not always be effective as that group responds to those efforts in turn. And so being able to be flexible and dynamic in the kinds of programming you offer and in the ways that you conceptualize participants to be nimble and not to be sort of bogged down in, well, this was what it looked like five years ago, it must be this way now, becomes obviously very important when we look at this timeline. So I'll stop there, thanks a lot. <laughs>